In July 2012, when I was given nine months to live as a newly diagnosed stage four patient, I knew that if I didn't take risks, I would die. So, I know all about the risks of not taking risks in melanoma treatment. Welcome to this day of MPNE 2015. I think in the past there were cases where we had new medicines that looked very promising and that then in the longer run came with horrendous side effects. And I think that has rightfully made society quite conscious about side effects and long-term side effects of drugs. Now, in a situation like melanoma, where the overall situation is dire and people used to have a survival of six to nine months after diagnosis, we are in a very different situation. It is nearly certain you're going to die. So side effects all of a sudden become less of a concern because you're fighting for your life. We are now having a situation where patients are prevented from accessing drugs out of safety concerns, which basically leaves them to die in safety. So actually the clinical trials are actually getting in the way uh, of people, uh, people thinking that they would be... And they were saying in some cases that they actually were hiding side effects that they were experiencing from the doctors because they were very anxious that they'd actually be taken off the treatment that they felt might be beneficial to them. The trials have been presented, the clock is ticking, yet we do not have these medications now at hand for treating first line our stage 4 patients. So lives are lost. And this I can share with you for a medical oncologist, my per, in my personal experience, this is the worst of situations. So while consulting, while advising, while discussing the risk with patients that are in need of these treatments, I can't avoid reflecting on the chance that we fail to offer them to get the benefit from these new medicines. Start the discussion. Um, what's the value? The value is what we bring to, to patients, it's patient benefit is the value. And the reason we exist as an industry... The biggest risk is the risk that we lose something of potential benefit to patients. Innovation is complex in our sector, it's lengthy, it's expensive and it's uncertain. So there's an aspect of risk there. Equally, innovation is regulated to protect the wider interest. It's, it's regulated to make sure that the, the process stays reasonably efficient. It's regulated to ensure that the public is not exposed to excessive harm. So there is a, a risk on the side of the regulator as well. And what we have to do is try and find forms of regulation which are supportive of the new science that's coming through and which actually reflect patient, patient needs and patient benefits. In your uh, discussions with companies, they say, ah, uh, we're doing this because e Emma has asked us to do it. And it when as regulators we, we look at these questions, we put, try to put ourselves in the shoes of patients and uh, think of uh, how would they value a certain benefit for, for a certain toxicity, like is the toxicity worth uh, for a certain gain in, in benefit. So we are running a, a pilot where we're doing a survey with uh, patients, carers and advocates, for example, uh, with this organization, so the Melanoma Patient Network Europe. And um, we're trying to see if their preferences are similar or different and um, I think we're getting some very encouraging preliminary results that this is a useful way for capturing the way uh, a distribution of uh, preferences in these, in these three groups and start to understand why uh, there are differences in the preferences. The purpose of this tool is to find out how patients exactly value a gain or a 
of a certain benefit versus a certain risk to get closer to the trade-off that patients make. So we actually hope that we get a measure of how patients differ, differ from other stakeholders. And I hope that this will be a concept that will be widely used in the future. That nearly all patients benefited from this innovative oral treatment. And you can tell from the scans that undoubtedly such an agent would bring a palliative, a meaningful ben palliative benefit to all patients with BRAF mutant melanoma. Benefit, obviously, ultimately, is defined in gaining survival, in overall survival. But for me as a medical oncologist, that's not the only relevant endpoint. If you are suffering from a disease that causes debilitating symptoms, health-related quality of life, living a remission, feeling well for a meaningful period of time, is also on our agenda. And with respect to melanoma, of course, advanced melanoma has different presentations. You may be diagnosed with a small uh, lesion in your lung that is completely asymptomatic. The goal there today, for me, it's no less than cure. We know we have the potential for a, for a percentage of our patients to er eradicate the disease. And I'm so happy that I'm now witnessing the first 10-year anniversary of one of my patients who, have, who has had this chance to have a complete remission. And she was even in a stage 4 M1C diagnosed at the time and treated with immunotherapy. And I'm going to be talking about how we can decide um, who takes the risks, who decides which risks are acceptable, who decides when we come to make decisions which is the right decision for the patient. When we think about risk, we have to think about the capacity for benefit. And in cancer treatment, a patient's capacity to benefit is at the earliest stage of disease. So at that stage, there are more lines of standard therapies available. There is, in my view, a direct correlation between the stage of your cancer and the level of risk you are willing to accept. It's like playing a game of chess with melanoma. A game, I can assure you, I never wanted to play. A game with dire consequences. I can see now how every decision I have made throughout my treatment has contributed to where I am on the board. Every time I make a decision, I'm reluctant to take my hand off my chess piece in case it's the wrong one. I look around hoping for clues. Melanoma is always one step ahead. You need to be very brave to play this game. Now I've done challenge, I know 100% my melanoma How can we possibly shorten the delay in access to innovative, best-in-class, life-saving, innovative treatments as a first option for treatment? Once the a drug has been registered, so it has proven its efficacy, it's accepted by regulators, thereafter there is still a huge opportunity to learn more to see how the drug behaves in uh, real life. And most often these days we get early access through programs conducted by pharma. And I'm referring to uh, compassionate use, as long as the drug is not registered, medical need programs once it's registered. Inherently by regulation, a sponsor, a pharma sponsor, cannot collect prospective data, outcome data, from such programs. Otherwise, they would need to call it a clinical trial. And there is a missed opportunity. I think we could, while the drug is being used, collect those data prospectively. There could be systems for early conditional reimbursement in a way that we still can collect this real-life data. Or we all together as a society 
could facilitate or encourage programs where these drugs are made immediately available would be not of any extra cost to industry because it would be equivalent to the way they are giving the drugs in their medical need or compassionate use programs. But please allow, at that point in time, uh, non-for-profit organizations such as university hospitals or, for instance, ERTC, to conduct these programs and have us collect this real-life data. HD agencies, like NICE, um, on the other hand... They try to get the population in the trials to be as similar as possible. So they'll exclude people who are old or who are young or who are taking other medications because all, all that, that information may actually make it very difficult to tell what the drug's actually doing. What we're doing within Get Real is trying to see if we can relax some of those criteria so we make the patients in the trials look more like the patients who receive the drug in everyday practice. Um, and this means we have to use more sophisticated methods of analysis to try and get around the fact that you've got a, a much, the, the patients are very different and they will be responding differently. So in my opinion, a higher level of civilization will only be reached if we can make progress without the need of sacrificing lives. Um. Our investment in working with patient groups needs to be parallel with a receptivity on the part of regulators and payers towards the output. If, for example, we are investing in trying to understand um, what sort of innovation a particular patient group needs, what sort of medicines would make a difference to their lives, um, unless the regulators and the payers are also willing to recognise those types of benefits, then that investment isn't going to go anywhere. You know, it, it, it will enable us to make a, a, a better medicine, one that would be more appreciated by patients. But unless there's a parallel recognition in the processes of the regulators and the payers, then we, we have a systemic problem. So, in a way, we are facing here a conundrum, and I use the denomination Innovation conundrum. The idea is to bring around the table all the expertise you need to bring new medicines to patients. And that's not only classical researchers or physicians. You need economists, for example, to see how can we best invest the funds that are available in the public, in the private uh, sectors. And this really, re this is another type of science, it's economic science. Another aspect to address this conundrum is to take advantage of the huge opportunity offered by the bioinformatic revolution. You need bioinformaticians, but these people are very good in computers, you know, artificial intelligence but they have to realize what they are working for. And for example, what I will do is to uh, put them in direct contact with patients so that they understand, you know, what's the final goal of what they are doing. Now, they are just not, say, you know, uh, <clears throat> in front of a computer, but that they reflect of the significance of their work, and they reflect on the fact that there are indeed an, essen an essential element in this long chain from, uh, you know, basic research to, uh, to treatment. Uh, thank you very much for being here, for coming here, for doing this in your free time. And... Thanks so much. As risk-benefit assessment is so crucial to anything we're doing, I hope that this conference has contributed to mutual understanding how different parties see and understand risk. And from my perspective, I obviously hope that the patient perspective becomes central to anything related to medicines and healthcare, because that is the ultimate reason for us to have medicines and healthcare. And for me, I believe in order to do so, we have to get patients more systematically involved in any of those processes. Because from a personal experience, I know that one cannot anticipate what it is like to be a patient. We all have ideas what it could be, but once you are on the other side, you realize that in fact you had, you had no idea. 
So the patients are the only ones in our society who can really tell us how it is truly like to be in that situation. <laughs> There is currently no funding for TILS treatment in the UK, so my house is on the market to find the 70k required to finance the procedure on a private client basis. This makes me angry, not just for me, but for the door slammed in other melanoma patients' faces. Hopefully in time, this may change. In the interim, I'm assessing my next move. I still have my hand on my chest piece, but I know the next high-risk decision will need to be made.